So what we learned, right, so far, was that there are profiles of longitudinal change with Parkinson's disease that suggest there are three disease-specific epochs or periods. The first beginning about five years prior to the diagnosis, and that's a decline in working memory. It actually has a medical word. It's called bradyphrenia, slow thinking. Okay? And this precedes a decline in the ability to use visual spatial skills in problem solving. Then this is followed later by an inability to retrieve memory from long-term sources. Right? The loss of ability to use well-learned information. Only toward the very end, when people are already impaired, do classic kind of tests of new learning and language change. So if you're using a test like that that we use for Alzheimer's disease, it's going to fail. Okay? So we've now created the base for how we could design a clinical trial going forward. So let's talk about how we do some modeling. So one of the more difficult symptoms of Lewy body dementia is this concept of cognitive fluctuations. Okay? This is a spontaneous change in alertness, attention, and concentration. And again, as I said before, it can vary from minute to minute, from hour to hour. And it's present in about 70% of patients with Lewy body dementia, but only about 25% of people with Alzheimer's disease, and about 5% of people who have, you know, are healthy. Okay? So not very common in them. Um, but there's no standardized way to actually measure it. Now think about this. You have a symptom that's a core feature that's used to make the diagnosis of Lewy body disease, but there's no standardized way or definition of what it actually is. Makes it a very, very hard symptom to, to use, right? Um, think about this. A symptom is present in three out of every four people who have the disease, but there's no actual way to measure that symptom. That symptom's not very helpful then in the average clinical setting. Uh, so we use a, a scale called the Mayo Fluctuation Questionnaire to try to understand this. Uh, it gives four questions that we can rate as yes, no, and if they have three of the four symptoms, they have a fluctuation. Okay? So we can use some quantitative measure. <clears throat> and what we found was people who fluctuate perform worse on all of their cognitive tests. Okay? So if you're a fluctuator as opposed to a non-fluctuator, you have a significant worsening of your cognitive abilities. And in particular, if you have illogical or disorganized thinking, that's the strongest predictor of a poor performance on a cognitive test. Okay. We've then done some imaging studies to try to understand this. Okay. So your brain is really a series of networks, right? It looks like one big gray sloshy organ, but it, what it really is is divided into lots and lots of different networks. And two networks are ones called, we're going to talk about, one is called the default mode. So this is what your brain is doing when you're not doing anything. Okay? When you're just totally sort of daydreaming, your default network is on. When you go to do something, you have to pay attention. So your default mode network should turn off, and your attention network should turn on. Okay? And what we found is people who fluctuate, they're not switching from default mode to attention. Okay? So that switch is broken. So they so normally, if you're paying attention to me right now, your default mode, your, your default mode network is off, and your dorsal attention network is on. If you're kind of slumped in your chair and thinking, when is this guy going to get finished, then your default mode network is working, okay? In people who fluctuate, that ability to switch back and forth is broken. And so what we have is a model of a faulty switch, okay? So normally, you're either paying attention or you're at rest, and so all your balls are in a certain bin. But in people who fluctuate, the switch is broken, and so basically your balls are equally distributed back and forth. Well, if you're looking at someone and supposed to be paying attention, but you're really in a default mode network, what are you going to look like? You're going to stare blankly forward, and you're not attending to the, what's going on in front of you. So what did we learn? 
we learned that the presence of these fluctuations significantly worsens cognitive performance and increases your risk of doing poorly on a test by up to 34-fold. Okay? That's a significant increase. Okay? Disorganized, illogical thinking is the strongest single symptom associated with worsening performance. And that we think the underlying problem with this is a breakdown of how the brain switches back and forth from paying attention to not paying attention. So we wanted to study this a little bit better. So these are really dedicated individuals who participated in our study. So has anybody ever had an EEG before? Yeah. So EEGs generally have about 128 leads. Um, that's, a, that's a really dense EEG. We use a high density EEG with 256 leads. Okay? So this takes more than an hour to put on. Okay? And you can see this is the person with the leads on. They are really covering every part of their brain. So we can map out the brain very, very detailed. And what we found is that the EEG measures your brain wave activity. Okay? And your, like everything else, your brain has lots of different waves. It has fast waves, it has intermediate waves, it has slow waves. Um, so the red is your alpha rhythm. That's your sort of awake rhythm. Okay? Um, and the, uh, the rhythms down here uh, tend to be the slower waves. Um, your beta is actually your fastest wave, uh, but it's not very prominent unless you're like on a sedative medicine, then it tends to increase the beta waves. So these are our controls. These are our people with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. These are the people with Parkinson's disease, and these are the people with Parkinson's dementia, right? So controls, MCI, PD, PD impaired. Patterns look different, don't they? Okay? And they look different in different ways, right? So MCI due to Alzheimer's disease looks entirely different than MCI due to Parkinson's disease. This looks entirely different than this. And in particular, I don't know if you can really appreciate it from the back. If you look at the slide, there's also a slide in the back of you. So if you're in the back, you may see the color a little better. Um, in PDI, the green increases dramatically, okay? The green is amongst the slowest of the brain waves. Okay? These are the waves that increase while you're sleeping. These are people that are awake. Okay? Uh, and so their br entire brain rhythms are disrupted. And these slow sleep waves are increasing even though they're wide awake. We can also do functional MRI so we can look at networks. Okay. As I said, the brain is a series of networks. And so we've been improving our, our ability to do this over time. We used to be able to look at only one network at a time. And then we got up to about 39 networks at a time. Now we're at 256 networks at the same time. Okay. And so you can actually develop what looks like a heat map. Okay. Um, and so you can line them all up, and you have the diagonal line right through here. And so you can see how all the different networks are related to each other. Okay? So you can query 256 networks at the same exact time. Okay? So what do we find? Well, in Parkinson's disease, there's a breakdown in what's called the frontal parietal executive network. So this is your problem-solving network. So your ability to kind of look at a problem and figure it out. And in Parkinson's disease, it breaks down. And it breaks down very early. Your visual network changes. Okay? Your ability to process visual information breaks down. And it breaks down from controls to Parkinson's disease, and then from Parkinson's disease to Parkinson's disease with impairment, cognitive impairment. Okay? So it's a continual breakdown. <laughs> One of the more exciting things we've recently described, <clears throat> and I'm presenting this at a meeting in France uh, later this month, is a breakdown in what's called the cingulo opercular network. Sounds fancy, right? This is your error checking network. This is the part of the brain that decides just before you do something if you're doing it right. Okay? In other words, if you're going to step your brain decides really quickly as if your foot is stepping in the right place or not. 
Um, and so what we see is a breakdown in this network. Um, and so we've been able to build these models more and more. Um, and we can now use these really fancy spatial maps. Okay? So we can use the power of, of high processing computing skills to build spatial maps. So we can identify specific areas where this is changing. And what we find is that as you go from controlled individuals to Parkinson's disease, there's an initial increase in the singular opercular network. Okay? In other words, you're developing Parkinson's, motor Parkinson's disease. You're now shuffling. You're bent over. And so your brain is trying to figure out every time I take a step, is this a correct step? So there's an initial increase in that. However, as the cognitive impairment begins, the network breaks apart. And there's a marked decrease in the ability of this network to fire. So what's that mean for people with Parkinson's disease and cognitive impairment is they're going to fall a lot more. And a fall in an older adult is, can be a very, very dangerous consequence. Okay.